I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. I'm Larry Moan, president of the Manhattan Institute, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It is my honor today to offer a brief introduction for Carl Schramm, president and chief executive officer of the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, which is the world's largest foundation dedicated to advancing entrepreneurial success. Carl has been hailed by The Economist magazine as America's leading evangelist of entrepreneurship, and he truly is one of the preeminent thinkers on market capitalism in the world today. Carl joined the Kauffman Foundation in 2002 after a long career as an economist, lawyer, and an entrepreneur himself who founded two successful health companies. Under his leadership over the past six years, the Kauffman Foundation has come to be regarded as one of the country's most important and innovative foundations, a foundation that generates so much original research and so many great ideas that I regard it as a sister think tank. In addition to his pathbreaking work on the efficacy of capitalism and the importance of entrepreneurship, Carl has also become an influential voice in the realm of philanthropy. He has shaken up the foundation world by arguing that America's foundations need to become more efficient, accountable, and entrepreneurial, and that they need to remain true to their donor's founding intent. He is also the author of a number of books, including most recently, The Entrepreneurial Imperative and Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism, which he co-authored with his colleagues Robert Lytan and William Baumel. Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism is an emerging classic, widely read both in the States and abroad. It has been translated into seven languages and was recently named one of the top 10 books that drive debate by the US Chamber of Commerce. By the way, we had a panel discussion with Carl here last year and it was, it was terrific on the book. He's also a contributing editor of Inc. Magazine and his writing has appeared in Foreign Affairs, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Newsweek, and a number of other prestigious publications. In fact, just yesterday, I came across a wonderful piece Carl wrote for CNN's website titled Joe, Entrepreneur, Joe the Entrepreneur, in which he argued that entrepreneurs like the off-sided Joe the Plumber are the lifeblood of the American economy, and that our political leaders need to do everything they can to help nurture and support the 600,000 Americans who will launch their own companies this year. As Carl put it, quote, none of what America has achieved or what we have given the world could have happened had we not been first and foremost a nation that believed in entrepreneurs. Please join me in welcoming one of America's truly indispensable public intellectuals, Carl Schramm. Thank you, Larry, and no thank you. Uh, first, um, thank you for that nice introduction. No thank you, because you gave my speech. And worse, um, my whole life I have cringed at the very words, public intellectuals. Uh, whoever those people are who self-proclaim that, I always get creepy when I see them on TV, right? It means they don't have a real job, I think, right? Um, I, I'm delighted to be here at the Manhattan Institute. I'm a huge fan of yours. And I see, uh, among other people in the audience, uh, Nelson Brahms, who's one of your fathers uh, at your creation. <laughs> and for a long time in my career, I sojourned in the insurance industry and got to know Nelson and several of his wonderful folks at the Equitable Society. And um, I just say, Nelson, if nothing else happened but that this institution that Larry has so ably run for so long, if nothing else happened but for the work on community policing that had so much to do with making this city so livable, it would be a triumph. And there is so much more that the Manhattan Institute has done. So we're all in your debt, Larry, for this fantastic institution you've put together. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk today about creative destruction and capitalism. And I'm going to begin by saying I bet that more people have heard the phrase creative destruction than know its author, Joseph Schumpeter. Creative destruction is the great Austrian economist's signature phrase, and it encapsulates his most famous idea that any economy's most important actors are the people who create new innovations, new jobs, new companies, new industries, and even wholly new sectors. The destruction part refers to what happens when old industries get displaced. The classic example, beloved by economists for all time, is the buggy whip industry at the dawn of the automobile age. Yes, the industry was destroyed and workers lost their jobs and companies went out of business. But look what emerged, an industry that not only employs many hundreds of thousands, that created vast new wealth, 
but also to transform many other industries and even society itself. Now, those of you who have been watching the markets over the last several weeks, that is to say all of us, have seen a lot of destruction, but very little creativity, except, sad to say, from the government. And what worries me, and what would certainly worry Joseph Schumpeter, is that the government's creativity is only just beginning. This is especially frightening given all the results of past government quote-unquote creativity in response to similar, indeed far lesser, crises. It suffices, I think, to mention in this context Sarbanes-Oxley, about which I'll have more to say in just a moment. There is no question that we are in the middle of a terrifying economic drama. I think also there is little question that government not only failed to prevent it, but in this case, government helped to bring it on in the first place. More frightening still is the prospect of further government creativity in the name of fixing a mess that the government took a, such a direct role in creating. Nearly 20 years ago in a landmark book entitled Crisis and Leviathan, the economist Robert Higgs showed that with merciless analytic rigor how government exploits crises, real and imagined, government created or otherwise, to increase government control over the private sector. Watching the actions of our elected and appointed officials and especially listening to them talk about what they wish to do but have yet to do, it is hard to escape the conclusion that Higgs's nightmare is about to be repeated. I think there is little question, purely from the perspective of economics, that none of the ideas under consideration will help the American or the world economy emerge successfully from this crisis. Indeed, most if not all of them will make recovery slower, weaker, and less dynamic. Our political class assumes that the public wants security above all else, protection from the market's rougher edges, from inevitable, inevitable downturns, from perfectly fair and just market outcomes, for instance, the failure of badly run companies or the displacement of outmoded industries, and of course, from the effect of major crises such as this. And obviously, to a great extent, the political class is right. Most of the public does demand and does want government protection most of the time, largely because they have been trained to expect it from government. It has become part of our expectation in the modern age. And that's immaterial. Even if some of the public doesn't want it, all of the public is about to get it. What we, the public, we, the public, need to understand is the best guarantor of personal financial security is not government, but growth. And the whole essence of my remarks today will be about growth as the lost word in the vocabulary of this crisis. True, as the buggy whip example and hundreds of others show, growth is no guarantee that this job or that this company or that this industry will be around forever. But government can't guarantee that either, and nobody, nothing can, and nobody would really want that. What growth does deliver is rising incomes for all, or nearly for all, unprecedented headway against poverty, and expanded individual liberty. Indeed, the only way freedom can be made secure for any individual is within a growing economy. Political freedom depends on economic expansion. This is the great insight of the recent Nobel Prize winner, Amaria Sen, who in the third world tells us that the expansion of freedom comes only with the creation of capitalism. <laughs> only capitalism can make wealth and liberty at the same time. And of course, capitalism can expand human welfare faster than any other social or economic order ever experienced. But a future in which growth and freedom continue to jointly secure each other is not certain. Humans appear to have a need to develop alternative views of economic reality. They seem to be, there seems to be an endless capacity to want to see the market and its workings, the appropriate role of the state, and the true best interests of the individual in idealistic or romantic or worse utopian ways. When economic contractions occur, as they inevitably and predictably will happen, the critique of capitalism becomes yet more shrill and more powerful. Now such critiques always, or almost always, 
are based on a fundamental mistake. They confuse the market distorting layers that government forces onto capitalism's hull, like so many drag inducing barnacles, with capitalism itself. The vessel, not the barnacles, is assumed to be the problem. But the vessel is seaworthy. It will sail just fine unfettered if it is allowed to. The current crisis is the direct result of efforts to manipulate markets to achieve a political end, namely, to raise the home, home ownership rate, particularly in poor and minority communities. Now this may be a laudable goal. Indeed, I think we would all agree that it is. But it is one best achieved by the market. Indeed, the free market has done more throughout history to house more people, to ever higher sanitary and quality standards than anything since mankind's discovery that wood is just not for burning. Left to its own devices, the market will build enough housing for the population. It may not, on day one, make ownership within reach of all, but it and it alone can, cre can create economic growth that diffuses wealth broadly and deeply throughout the society, making homes more affordable to increasing numbers of people, and the evidence of that exists in 150 years of expanding home ownership in the United States. Government imposed shortcuts, on the other hand, produce neither wealth nor homes, but only, as we have seen all too vividly, misery. I have heard the subprime crisis referred to as, quote, affirmative action for the housing market. I think this is a misguided and false comparison, and it may surprise you that I do. But consider this, considering this premise, allows us to see the housing crisis just a little bit more clearly. First, affirmative action is not a programmatic effort that costs the government any money. Whatever economic dislocations that its opponents might argue, it does not involve direct outlays. The housing credit market, however, benefited from billions that were funneled at the direction of Congress through the agency of Fannie and Freddie. In other words, it was, my term, a non-governmental governmental, much like the equivalent of a non-bank bank, spending program with costs now being underwritten by taxpayers, costs spiraling into the billions of dollars. Now second, while affirmative action is far from universally popular, it at least is widely debated and a widely understood policy, and one that has been examined and validated by the courts. Subprime, however, while not exactly hatched in secret, remains something discussed far from the center of public view and public debate, and is barely understood by the people at large, let alone many of the people who had a hand in manufacturing it. Third, affirmative action can be and is applied only to the groups intended to benefit. That is, if you want to increase the participation of a particular group, simply design a program that applies to members of that group and not to others. Lending standards, however, don't work that way. You can't loosen lending standards for some without loosening lending standards for all, as we have discovered. The result has been, in addition to helping low-income buyers afford loans, we have also made things like home equity loans and flipping a far more affordable event, and indeed, something that is, is equally distributed among the affluent population. The borrowing frenzy that resulted was not confined to the poor and minority communities. Fourth and finally, one could argue that affirmative action is victimless in this sense. Yes, the hyper-qualified kid who is rejected from Harvard in favor of a worthy but less qualified minority applicant may have suffered. But in the end, he will get into the University of Massachusetts. He will use his smarts to graduate near the top of his class. He will attend a fine professional school, perhaps start a business. He will be just fine. But what about, in the current instance, the worker who makes $60,000 a year who was encouraged by his government, albeit indirectly, to buy a $350,000 house, which he is now going to lose. What about the particularly pernicious, and as best I can see, unremarked upon problem of all those people priced out of the housing market in their own communities in the course of this bubble? They were the struggling families 
who had saved because who had saved and because of rising prices could never quite swing their new house. They were the people like my parents who played by the old rules. What about all those people who've lost 20 to 30 percent of their equity in their house through the cause of this crisis? And what about the taxpayers now footing the colossal bill for this colossal mess? These are victims. They are victims not of capitalism, not even of the failures of capitalism, but of misguided attempts to interfere with capitalism. President Sarkozy of France proposed a brilliant formulation only two weeks ago. He said, and I quote, the financial crisis is not the crisis of capitalism. It is the crisis of a system that has distanced itself from the most fundamental values of capitalism, which betrayed the spirit of capitalism. Exactly so. Capitalism does not need to be saved from itself or even from some of its own inherited tendencies, inherent tendencies. Right now, rather, it urgently needs to be saved from those who would alter and distort it in the name of security or stability or fairness. President Sarkozy's comment points to the insight that animates the work of many economists and many economists at the Kauffman Foundation. And it points to the solution to the current crisis as well. My brilliant writing partner, Bob Lighton, the great economist, Will Baumel, and I have argued that capitalism is not monolithic. It comes in four identifiable forms, only two of which deliver real, long-term benefits to society, and only one of which is responsible for the robust growth on which so much of our well-being depends. Consider. Entrepreneurship is the engine that lifted the country out of its last economic crisis, the malaise of the 1970s and the 1980s. Then the country was at least as dispirited as it is now, and with good reason. Mortgage rates were 10 percent, the CPI was running at 12 percent, and the stock market had yet to move, had not moved in a decade. Indeed, entrepreneurial capitalism is an altogether accurate description for the enormously productive period we have enjoyed these last 20 years. And before we succumb to a bout of economic amnesia and dismiss all the positives in our recent history, let's recall that we've experienced historically high levels of productivity gains and enormous real growth because of a long period of stable prices. And while it can be argued that relative normal incomes for some have stagnated, Nevertheless, the standard of living for all Americans has risen remarkably since 1980. In the face of the financial crisis, entrepreneurial capitalism is threatened. It is threatened from without by the prospect of new onerous and, con and counterproductive regulation and taxation, and is threatened from within by a declining appetite on the part of American people to start new businesses and take the risks involved. This should not come as a surprise, not at this moment. What is troubling, however, is not so much the people's retreat into, uh, into securitarian thinking. It is their belief, which is showing in polling data, that government should be the source of all of our security. Pragmatically, we must conclude that if we are to advance capitalism, we must develop a new approach to protecting Americans. We might have before us a modern day moment equal to what Bismarck went through and created in Germany. But let us hope that we have learned something from our own and from Europe's design of government programs and how they have been funded and how they have been approached as permanent and unchanging in the face of what we know to be dynamic economic and social needs. We must approach the perceived need for security with new thinking about what may be called a new inflexible safety net. It will require a new kind of thinking relating to rights regarding individual claims. We must consider anew the concept of rights-based claims. And we must understand that what might be needed to help somebody today can prove to be a support program that disables them tomorrow by creating false dependency on, for the individual and an unsustainable economic burden on the entire society for all of the foreseeable future. 
To use my colleague Bob Lighton's memorable phrase, the goal should be a safety net that operates like a trampoline, not a hammock. It should see people through tough times by getting them ready for the future ahead. It should not be seen as a permanent substitute for initiative. The future, more difficult challenge, is that we must figure out how to increase people's sense of security without making government itself bigger or more powerful. In the internet age, with friction-free information markets, we don't need to hire thousands of job counselors to help people read want ads. And we must remember that entrepreneurial capitalism cannot be revived or flourish if new government security programs end up attenuating the individual's ultimate responsibility to attend to his or her own welfare. Most Americans want new forms of government. They want innovations that are tailored to specific situations and specific times. They think the government should help at moments like these, but they distrust government enormously. A recent survey commissioned by the Coffin Foundation shows that most people believe government, and specifically the Congress, is most responsible for the current crisis. Respondents also overwhelmingly said that government cannot solve the problem. Over 70% of respondents said that the private firm must get us out of this economic ditch that we are driving ourselves into. Moreover, our polling tells us that more than 70% of Americans want to create and to a new business and to work for themselves in their own business. Now, these data are only one month old, mind you. Incidentally, these people who are polled and who speak these dreams are middle class working people just like Joe the plumber. Dismiss him, if you will. To me, he is every man. He is Fred the roofer and Veronica the nurse's aide who may want to start a business and who, like my grandmother, hoped that her son's son might own a business someday and might become rich. These are not Roosevelt's forgotten men. They are our neighbors who hold the same hopes for themselves and their children that we do. So how might we operate to forestall the crippling of entrepreneurial capitalism? Many ideas must be considered and I will propose four considerations that I think, if not the most important starting points, are at least worthy of our focus. The first is that by repairing our economy, it cannot be done by focusing on what is called banker's greed on Wall Street. This is a trope that is in universal use by both Republicans and Democrats. While there was plenty of quote unquote banker's greed to go around, Today's problem is first and foremost one that the Congress created when it sought to change the very nature of risk relating to assuming mortgage debt for householders. To proceed upon a course of developing complex innovations and regulations for banks in the mortgage market will overlook the problem entirely. And to a great extent, this political drama will be meant to distract from inquiring too deeply into the true causes of this problem, namely our political system. Three years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, there existed all the regulatory mechanisms, all the statutory authority needed to stop this crisis from happening. Congress is expressly subverting existing regulatory regimes of the securities in banking markets in a non-legislative fashion that might be called proactive, directive oversight to widen home ownership to persons who, it turns out, could not afford the homes they were encouraged to purchase. It was assuming the process of rulemaking, and in doing so, in such a way that it was effectively spending monies that were not part of the federal budget. Consider also the Sarbanes-Oxley response to Enron WorldCom, the scandals beginning at this decade. All the regulatory authority needed existed in the SEC acts and its enabling statutes, but a costly and ill-considered regulatory innovation was nonetheless added on top. Congress, in the space of a few months, advised apparently by persons who did not understand the essence of the problem, 
managed to create legislation that had, as nearly all such sweep sweeping legislative attempts to do, hugely unforeseen consequences. Perhaps the most severe was the dampening effect on public financing for young firms, an issue critical to the advance of entrepreneurial capitalism. Sarbanes-Oxley is the primary reason young firms no longer go public. The IPO, like the dodo bird itself, has become an extinct species, at least on this side of the Atlantic. This discussion points to the enormity of the challenge. Delegating regulatory powers has always held the potential to contravene the fundamental tenets of democratic government. Democracies can tolerate and trust regulation only when it is understood that such regulation will be enforced by nonpartisan experts and not by political actors working towards political ends. When Congress engages in or even threatens such directive oversight, it sends signals that either by design or as a byproduct undermine the principles and practice of nonpartisan apolitical regulation. Thus, for capitalism to work well, we must reestablish and respect the doctrine of regulatory delegation. In any event, regulation is emphatically not the solution to the current crisis. Role clarity between legis the legislative branch and the bureaucracy is a first step in this direction. This is an objective that the federal courts must also recognize. But another step should be protecting regulators from the illegal and unwholesome influence of legislators. The SEC could have stopped Enron and WorldCom from happening. The Treasury, the Fed, and the SEC could have stopped the housing crisis from happening. Our regulators no longer appear to operate as fixed-term, judge-like, public-spirited experts interested only in advancing the common wheel. Perhaps longer terms and an absolute bar on subsequent work in the regulated industry may be a step in the direction of creating independent and non-capturable regulation in the public's interest. A second thing to be considered is the so-called government-sponsored enterprise. I believe that as a matter of constitutional amending, we should prohibit this creature from ever existing. Congress should not operate businesses nor be able to manage such businesses in a de facto manner as it has done with Freddie and Fannie, no matter what the alleged high-blown public purpose or policy objective might be. Third, we must appreciate we cannot afford all that we seem to think we can if only government will buy it for us with the government's money. Taxes used to be the real-time cost of government, transparent, understood by all. In the last five weeks, we have further mortgaged ourselves to a future, a future that means we will not be able to take advantages of many opportunities that lie ahead. And worse, we have a debate underway about buying in the public sector solutions that were appropriate perhaps 30 years ago, but are clearly not appropriate today. Take health care, for example. The discussion about government's role seems to focus always on the expansion of the model of Medicare and Medicaid. Now, no one would design these programs to look like this today. So why compound the error by making these obsolete health care payment solutions the basis of tomorrow's promise? Remember, with the debt load we now face, government's new safety net must come with a smaller and less costly government. It will require the solutions of entrepreneurs. We can do better than what we did in 1965 when we invented Medicare and Medicaid. For heaven's sakes, we bring forth thousands of better ways to deliver medicine every year. Surely, the private sector and a shared solution with government is the only way we can invent security in financing for health care in 2008, 2009, and 2010. The structure of Medicare and Medicaid, a 1965 structure, is clearly inappropriate to this need. Fourth, let us appreciate that globalization has been critical to the expansion of the American economy. We gain more jobs for all the jobs we ship overseas, and that is empirically true. Wouldn't it be nice to have a fact-based discussion on this? If we turn inward, we will see a depression in the mirror. 
We will have fewer jobs at home as we attempt to deny the world the jobs we send abroad. But more importantly, we will cut ourselves off from the tremendous talent that we need to fuel our economy. When I say this, it's often not well received. But nevertheless, I believe that we should encourage hundreds of thousands of the world's smartest students to come to the United States and study. And if they evidence and express an interest in citizenship, they should receive their papers the day they receive their diploma. Let me close with a consideration on the risks we face. The first is the loss of opportunity that happens every time our economy slows. The criminal tragedy of this particular downturn is that it could have been avoided. We were smart enough to make it happen. Some were smart enough to call for a cure when it could have been managed. Without the terrible losses, we will all carry for many years. Today, Roughly one-third of this nation's gross domestic product is attributable to fewer than 30,000 high-growth firms, about 1,000 of which are created every year. These firms account for nearly all the job growth in our economy. Whatever we do, we cannot scare off those who would start these companies. If entrepreneurs start only 500 of these companies next year, the loss gain from this shortfall will never, ever be recovered. Moreover, for the United States, what we must understand is growth is no longer a luxury. It is a necessity. When you consider the American economy's continuous advance on productivity, that is, we make more units with fewer workers, and you compound that with the great news that our population continues to grow, as opposed to that in many other parts of the world, including Western Europe, a startling fact becomes clear. We have to grow at at, last, at least 3% or more just to maintain full employment. Any slower, and the growth between jobs available and the workers we need, who need them will explode, and our unemployment rate will skyrocket. Our tax regimes, our regulatory strictures, our emerging view of risk and the obligations of individuals to commit to the market success by advancing their own self-interest and all the parts of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that will support it is precious. It is required for any future. The reactions to this crisis cannot involve a meat ax that kills entrepreneurs as a byproduct of effecting revenge on the leadership of our financial institutions. Perhaps this time, Congress will be a bit more reflective than reflexive as it envisions its actions. Schumpeter tells us loud and clear that the most important citizen is not the politician, nor the big businessman, nor the banker on Wall Street. They are all important but they are not central to the renewal of democratic capitalism. That role, that burden, and that honor falls to those of our fellow citizens who in the face of the challenges that always surround us are ready to undertake the pursuit of what it is that entrepreneurs do, their risky mission. They birth the new, they create most all of our jobs, and they make the wealth that would be more necessary than ever to purchase a future worth living. Thank you. Carl's willing to field some questions. Would you just wait till the microphone gets to you? Thanks, sir. There's a question. Michael Myers, New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question relates to the question of ethical conduct on the part of corporate CEOs. Uh, we've been living for some time now in an era of independent directors of Sarbanes, Oxley. Um, yet still, when you look, look at the congressional hearings on AIG, you had a situation where the AIG executives were hiding financial information from their own auditors and the uh, the CEO, the last CEO of AIG, 
who got some sort, the very smart one, who got some sort of certificate or diploma from a night school, um, he actually uh, lied to the shareholders. Uh, so my question is, how do you restore co uh, confidence in the public in the marketplace when uh, these kind of things still happen despite the era of uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, despite the era of law and order, despite the era of independent directors, and nobody gets prosecuted and nobody goes to prison? Uh, okay, I have a couple of different answers for that, but before I start, I want to tell you I went to law school at night. Okay? <laughs> so, so I'm going to resist your broadside about night schooling. All right? Now, um, first, I think you make, and I, I didn't do it as well as your question, but together we make a prima facie case that Sarbanes-Oxley didn't work. Sarbanes-Oxley imposed a new accounting approach, but more importantly, uh, made a market for retired auditors uh, by making them required members of boards of directors, right? And uh, we've watched a number of banks fail that had Sarbanes-Oxley worked, these were publicly held banks, should not have happened. In other words, starkly put, Sarbanes-Oxley didn't work once, not once since it was imposed, okay? And it didn't stop Health South, which was a wreck over the same issues a year after it was passed. Okay? So that raises the question, can one create regulatory or mechanical means? Because what the market craves, your question again is pregnant with its own answer, it craves transparency as to what the real honest to God numbers are underneath. Okay? And until the Congress has the courage to in fact enforce a rule like that, and even as we work out uh, the solution to this, as the Wall Street Journal has recently reported, the banking industry is down there still attempting to influence the way um, we score, count, and evaluate assets in their portfolios. Now, I would see that as, as an effort to resist transparency. So in a sense, what we need are accounting standards, but they're accounting standards that actually are probably a lot simpler. They have to be enforced, and in the end, they have to be understood by shareholders. Uh, and there's no buffer in between, like was attempted with Sarbanes-Oxley, obviously, that can stop it. Now, as to the last question, why is nobody going to jail? Uh, in many regards, that is a long, long answer, which we'll talk about later, but that's decades of the buildup of a huge regulatory approach that has induced people to look, as lawyers say, for mala prohibita, not mala per se. Once upon a time, uh, Richard Whitney broke the law in New York, the securities law in New York, and he was in jail within 60 days. His family was disgraced. Okay, to read the story, his wife is begging with the sheriff to let her keep her wedding ring. Okay, there was just no doubt about what happened in securities fraud once upon a time, and those times are too far back in once upon a time land, okay? Now the problem is we've had phenomenal pro, pro, uh, uh, prosecutorial abuse along the way, particularly in securities, okay? And um, so we have a society that is in balance trying to figure out how we stop, you know, zealous political prosecution um, from what would be real, honest to God, uh, punishment for wrongdoing. And as you can see, by wandering on, I have no answer. Okay? But you've asked exactly the right questions. Under the GI Bill of Rights at the end of World War II, there was an encouragement for veterans to be able to buy their own homes with little or no money, etc. And that seemed to have been a very successful uh, operation. What happened, what was the difference economic indications or uh, which caused the um, uh, slowdown or the burn off of uh, home ownership under the current situation? I'm not sure I understand. I'm sorry, uh, the question. GI Bill, yes. uh, home ownership, that right. was a successful operation. Right, right. Uh, the Clinton administration uh, trying to raise home ownership uh, to a higher percentage uh, seem to have not worked quite well. 
what were the difference in the uh, that one was successful and the other was you not? You have the answer, Nelson. Just a second. Nelson Brahms has the answer. One is uh, that there are two generations in between though the passage of the bill and uh, uh, the results of, uh, of a little more liberal kind of uh, attitude as to uh, borrowing and the like. Uh, so look to the people themselves. Uh, this is not done by, by regulation alone. It's the, I might observe, you know, it's the greatest generation. Maybe that's what I'm really saying. You know? Well, but there is actually also a technical answer, and that is, uh, there, uh, under the, v, the VHA, there was, there was continuous testing of creditworthiness. These were veterans who had a job. You couldn't buy a house if you didn't. We've gone through a period of what's, you know, it's lightly been called ninja, uh, no income, no job, no assets. You, you could still get a, a loan, and that just wasn't the case. Uh, a, a veteran still met a, a real estate broker who had a little book, who opened it up, looked and taught the important lessons that no one else is apparently taught in the last decade, and that is uh, the gross cost of your principal and interest cannot exceed 23% uh, of your gross income. I mean, those used to be uh, the rules that simple real estate agents applied in every case to every veteran. And if you didn't have the gross income, you didn't get a mortgage. That is what's fundamentally different in this instance. Reaction to a suggestion that, that I uh, that Joe Nacera made in the New York Times. He quoted, I forget some hedge fund guy who had an idea which sounded like a win-win. It was on the for, this is on the foreclosure problem. Uh, instead of foreclosing on people who are in default, his the suggestion was have the defaulting owner transfer the deed to the lender. Lender required to rent the property back for five years at market rents, mm -hmm. so at least they're making something in the interim. At the end of five years, the bank is free, or the lender is free to sell with a right of first refusal, if you will, so that if the homeowner, or former homeowner, has a 10%, can put up 10% equity, they, uh, in effect, can buy back their, their home, uh, and the lender will, uh, finance them based on the then fair market value, which hopefully will be better in five years. What is your reaction to that suggestion? Do you think that makes sense, and does it interfere with capitalism? No, I, I think it actually makes sense. It was a, actually, that idea was talked about a lot six, six Sundays ago, or the few days before six Sundays ago, when we got the four-page bill, okay? There were a number of ideas like that, but those were ideas that basically were meant to stabilize the market, recognize market conditions, and have sort of a balanced burn down of, of the problem. Instead, we got uh, a, a proposal a few days later that basically was premised on back then when it passed, we would buy up toxic debt, but subsequently became a we will refinance uh, banks and fortunately anticipated that there would be that kind of leeway in terms of, I think fortunately, in terms of the jurisdictional capacity of the Secretary of Treasury. Now, the fact is 90% of American voters thought the whole mess was too much of a delegation to the secretary. And I think wherever wisdom lies, we're too close to figure out whether it was good legislation or bad. But there were a number of proposals like that. My own reading of the political environment was this was in the hands of financial engineers who saw the world from the perspective of uh, investment banking um, as opposed to the market for house credit, okay? And, you know, every piece of legislation has the distortions of who it is who conceives of what the problem is fundamentally underneath. And this will be a very complicated book for Mr. Stern to write at some point. This is Rory Riggs. So the question I have, I've been pretty pissed off at big subsidies for big business. And, and as an entrepreneur, as you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I find the United States is the least 
conducive to entrepreneurial endeavors. And I think we do more to, from Sarbanes-Oxley to lack of incentives to actually incentivize us to build our businesses here. And I figure given you're our, our spokesperson for, for the entrepreneur, if you have an idea for a platform for what we can do to actually bring the entrepreneur to be excited about as a value proposition starting a business in the United States? Well, I think there are a few things you could do right away, okay? Had I engineered in that bill, I think uh, Article 1 would have been a repeal of Sarbanes-Oxley. Not that we haven't figured out, we've, we've thrown out various arteries. We know how to work around Sarbanes-Oxley. It's not the fatal blow to some extent I, I overstate here. On the other hand, as a matter of theater, it would have said America is actually committing itself back to the world of understanding that, that the creation of business and how it is financed is really important, okay? Now, as to more affirmative action, um, you know, it, one could think about the suspension, this is probably um, apostasy, but it, it again would be very important theater and it actually would work. If one suspended up to 30 or 40 or 60 employees the operation of all federal labor legislation um, for firms that are less than five, than five years old, okay? So if you're gonna stabilize at 25 employees at, at year six, then you comply, okay? But if you're a growing firm, you're, you're uh, you know, um, protected from some of these burdens. I think the, the same might go relative to a number of states could do this in terms of inventory taxation. Um, and I think uh, there ought to be, we could consider if you're making your money in the process of creating new jobs, okay, which, which could be a wide, wide latitude I would apply in terms of the businesses you're in, okay, in, including finance, okay. If, if there is a nexus between the advancing of monies or your own time, i.e. the risks you're taking and the creation of new jobs, there, there ought to be uh, a tax subsidy uh, directly for that, okay? We can, we can figure out the most complicated tax subsidies for ethanol and everything else, okay? If we wanted to create an entrepreneur's tax subsidy, we could figure it out pretty quickly, okay? Now, these would be the signals, Rory, that, again, I've used the word now three times, they are in fact theatrical, okay? But in this case, the theater is critical. And if somebody says, you know, I could be exempt. Another thing we might think about, and I speak very, very cautiously here because it's very hard to grab the metrics of this, okay? But a delay in student loan payment, or uh, in fact, the working off of student loans as if this was public service for people who do this. And what rings in my ears, we have a project at Kaufman is our concern that, that uh, a number of kids get out, particularly in engineering, holding $80,000 of debt where they basically say, okay, I'll go to work for Google because immediately my, my obligations to pay this off click in. And notwithstanding the fact I have a really fabulous idea, I want to be an entrepreneur, I got to go do that. Now a third dimension of this would be, and I, I speak about it here, we've spoken about it a lot, lot more clearly at Kaufman, you can go to our website and see our, our approach to what we do on this. But one is, we gotta solve this healthcare problem. Um, kids get out of college, they are on their own, okay? There, there are people, by the way, people who start high growth firms, this will likely come as a shock. The average age of the person who starts an Inc. 500 high growth firm is 37 years old when they start it. A lot of people have a thought that starting a high growth firm like Google or something is an event like solving Euler's or Euler's uh, 18th theorem, okay? If you ain't got it done by 17, it ain't never gonna happen, okay? That's just not the case with high growth firm starting. Uh, you know, it's, it's the business of technologists, it's the business of lawyers, it's the business of bankers, it's the business of a lot of people with MBAs who are successful in their high growth business starting because they have experience on which to rely. So uh, once again, I think it goes in, in the direction of talent and pushing talent into this risk taking. Henry? You know, one thing which has inflamed the public a great deal and which was reflected in the, uh, the law is the issue of executive compensation, particularly um, golden parachutes and nine-figure salaries and stock bonuses, especially for people whose companies have failed. 
And I think that has created a climate which is uh, hostile to business among vast sections of the American public who would ordinarily be sympathetic and appreciate individual initiative. What would you do, if anything, about uh, truly extravagant salaries uh, not related to performance? Um, not all that much. Um, I understand it is a theater issue, and there's no doubt there have been abuses in it. I think the impulse in the recovery legislation that if you're taking federal money uh, to, to save your entity, then, then the public has an interest in uh, what protections you get if, if uh, or what, what compensation is and whether or not you walk away from another failure with X millions of dollars, okay? But after that, it's, it's, I don't know how we draw the line over how people are paid. And in fact, there is a talent war out there. Now, the question you're going to ask back is, apparently, the people who do the vetting for talent goof all the time. And the price of goofing visited upon the shareholders is they buy people off uh, the payroll. Um, in, in the great scheme of things, um, it, it bothers people, but it's an unfortunate aspect of democracy that we worry on that issue as opposed to many issues of, of much greater profundity. Th think about it this way. The average congressman might make $140,000. Um, you know, these are people who create a huge more mischief on those salaries uh, in terms of lost wealth uh, to us than the person who might have made $50 million running an organization where that person has created, in the course of his or her stewardship of the organization, 20,000 new jobs. Um, if that person is making $50 million a year, um, or they make, they make that as their, their retirement uh, package, the net welfare costs of that are minuscule compared to uh, the welfare gain they have produced for the society, and to a huge extent, they had a big, big, big hand in creating that welfare gain. It was their leadership, their innovation, their risk-taking that made it happen. Thank you, Carl. Okay? Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.